boys' voices cutting through the still air of an ancient cathedral, one of the sweetest and most evocative of musical sounds. The working life of a choir boy is short, it's three to four years at most, but in that little time, these boys become the guardians of a tradition of English church music which has continued unbroken since the Middle Ages. These boys in the choir at Ely Cathedral in Cambridgeshire are in the main just ordinary lads. There's no guarantee that their striking musical ability will continue once their voices have broken. But when the boys meet former choristers at the annual reunion, it's clear that the short years spent in the choir have left a lasting impression. You left feeling with a great feeling of satisfaction with something that you've done and very dissatisfied with anything which is less than the best. Had a super education in music, naturally, and um, since then I've um, become not only a music teacher, um, but I've continued my singing and enjoyed that in other cathedrals. I've been a tenor in Chichester and Winchester and Durham Cathedral choirs. There are 21 boys in the Ely Choir, and as there's a certain amount of rivalry between the 40 choir schools in the country, the cathedral's director of music, Dr. Arthur Wills, wants only the best. What one looks for mainly is musical intelligence, or if you like, intelligent musicality. I'm not sure which one puts first, because uh, brightness, alertness is of vital importance. You want a very lively set of boys. I'd rather have a boys that were sometimes a bit of a handful to control than those that were rather dull and couldn't really satisfy me in any way at all. It was on the whim of a king that the great music of our cathedrals was not swept away in the tumult of the Reformation. Henry VIII determined that the cathedral music, the music that had gone on in the monasteries, minsters of this country, should continue. Now, just why he decided this, I don't know. He was a keen musician himself, you know. He's supposed to have composed some little pieces. And that particular period in England, the Renaissance, was full of artistic interests, and the court, no doubt, took a great, lively interest in all that was going on, and he must have decided this was something that shouldn't die. So we get the deans, the chapters, the boys, the lay clerks going on. This is really the start of it as we know it today. The boys are all pupils at the King's School Ely, a co-educational boarding school that is attached to the cathedral. They are part of the normal life of the school, but live in their own separate choir house. Morning, boys! It's hard for any boy to be woken at seven in the morning, and the boys in the choir house have a longer day ahead than the other King's School boarders. The choir house master, James Tilly, tries to ensure that his charges don't appear too special or precious to the rest of the school. Generally speaking, the other children, I think, are, are fairly proud of them. We they had a broadcast at Evensong about two or three weeks ago on Radio 3, and I was quite surprised when we went into tea to discover that all the other boarders in the other house had listened. And, you know, we didn't even know they knew about it. Um, sometimes they sort of say, oh, he's a, he's a pathetic chorister, but in actual fact, I think secretly they, they know that choristers have to be very tough indeed. It, it's, a choir boy is not wet, he's got to be tough, or he won't, he won't stand the pace. The head chorister, 13-year-old Oliver Thane, is a member of the school first 11 cricket and football teams. The choir try really quite hard not to be different from the other boys. We mix very well, actually. Yeah, we do. I mean, people can't tell we're crossing them like that, apart from our ties when we get admitted. But, yeah, we're, we're fine. When the choir workload is revealed, it's surprising there's any energy left for sport. On a weekday, uh, they will get up between seven and half past. 
they have to collect all their stuff for morning school and they go to breakfast uh, at about eight. At 25 past eight till 20 past nine, they have a, a morning chorister's practice for trebles only. This regime, this workload, it doesn't seem to do them any, any harm at all. They, they, they enjoy it. I don't think they would do it unless they did enjoy it. They get an enormous amount out of it. They are in fact professional singers being treated and trained as such from this very early age. first hear you you seem it very hard work but then you you just think you have to do it and it's, you just have to do it and so you just take it it's all right now Then they have a normal school day, four lessons in the morning, and with a break, lunch, and it might be afternoon school or games. Bring the king. And in those days, the king was sacred. He was anointed. And then about an hour off from half past three, they have to be in the cathedral again at quarter to five, ready to sing for a practice. And at half past five, they sing even song every day of the week except Wednesday. If a boy is very satisfactory for us, then normally the school will have no problem with him at all. It hardly ever happens. Intelligence seems to go musically and otherwise as a rule. Of course, you may get a situation where a boy perhaps has been held back. Uh, he has innate musical intelligence, but he hasn't managed to have the kind of academic background given to him in preparation for coming to a place like this. And you might have a problem there, but usually the intelligence is there. King's School at Ely has been co-educational for 15 years, and it's little wonder that the girls sometimes see the choir as a bit of a last bastion of male supremacy. Lots of girls enjoy singing, but it, they don't never get the chance. You know, boys can just walk into the school and take a test and see if they can get in, but girls don't get the chance, and it doesn't seem fair. So you think girls ought to be part of the choir? Well. In a way, yes, because, you know, then it gives the girls a chance to enjoy singing. But it's a tradition for boys to be a chorister, and it seems sad to ru ruin the tradition. Girls in the choir are something that the present all-male members regard as as likely or welcome as the presence of Martians. No, these boys got better voices. Is that a fact, or is that what Yeah, well, if girls came into the choir now, then... Um, it was for well, the tradition of Ely Choir being all boys, it's been all boys have all along, and they've had girls, uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't be such a good sound. They've got a very, a, a tone which doesn't, which lets the air out, they don't, there's nothing behind their voice, it's just the wrong kind of tone. <laughs> straight from class and cricket nets to the practice room for a final exercise to open up the voice for Evensong in the cathedral. song in the dimness of the medieval choir stalls is at the heart of the daily round of cathedral music. Boys' voices soar to the ancient roof, 
and there are perhaps no more than half a dozen in the congregation to hear the magic of the sound. as exalted, or not yet, is 10-year-old Matthew Maynell's first attempts on the trumpet. Musical education outside of singing is an important part of a choir boy's time at Ely. In their restricted free time, a choir of ordinary boys doing ordinary things. But it would be strange if all those hours amidst the gothic shadows of an ancient place of worship didn't make some impression on their minds. Religious aspect is a very hard thing to talk about, especially in the life of boys. It's difficult enough when you think about adults. It's precisely what impact religion has on their deepest being, their psyche, if you like. What the boys do get to know, of course, is uh, ecclesiastical, liturgical situation in which they're immersed every day. But I'm sure that they, they do imbibe a certain knowledge and a reaction to religious matters, which is of great importance to them. They may not realize it at the time, of course. What the boys can't help but realize is the essential timeless Englishness of what they're doing. The choir go out into the villages and towns of the diocese and even further afield to bring their music to ears that perhaps have never heard before the full splendor of the sound. The Dean of Ely, Bill Patterson, is determined to show his choir to the people. They go all over the place. Um, they've been very recently down to Epping. That's outside the diocese, but it's because one of the boys' fathers is the vicar of Epping. And we're going off to Wisbech in another 10 days at the end of the great Wisbech Rose Fair. What we're starting to do is to invite ourselves because it means that that way we get into corners of the diocese where they have not so much heard as there be a choir at Ely. Perhaps this is the crystallization of their achievement. The boys' voices of Ely Choir floating over the little Cambridge village of Grantchester on a fine summer's evening. Grantchester was the village chosen by the poet Rupert Brooke as the essential flavor of his country when he sat writing these verses in a dark cafe in Berlin just before the First World War. I only know that you may lie day long and watch the Cambridge sky and flower lulled in sleepy grass hear the cool lapse of hours pass until the centuries blend and blur in Grantchester, in Grantchester. Still in the dawn-lit waters cool, his ghostly lordship swims his pool, 
and tries the strokes, essays the tricks long learnt on Hellespont or sticks. Brooke went on to write about the war and die in it, and although not a local man, he's remembered on the village war memorial as the voice which made Grantchester and its streams, and above all its church, a symbol of all things English. And laughs the immortal river still under the mill, under the mill? Say, is there beauty yet to find, and certainty and quiet kind? Deep meadows yet for to forget the lies and truths and pain. Oh, yet stands the church clock at ten to three, and is there honey still for tea? But suddenly, with the breaking of his voice, a boy can be dramatically shut out from all this, one of the most intense parts of his young life. It happened pretty quickly, yeah. Um, I first noticed quite a few weeks back when um, I couldn't sing and I went to the sand. They said it was just hay fever, but it's getting worse, so. Are you very disappointed about that, the sort of end of your time in the choir? Well, to a certain extent, yeah, because mi I'll miss the music and I'll miss, you know, sort of being with everything and I won't be used to having so much free time. No, we don't kick them out. They're under contract until the end of the academic year in which their voice breaks. Does it affect them at all? Have you noticed any side effects when this sort of dramatic moment comes? Yeah, they can be a bit bolshy. Um, they're no longer, well, uh, at the centre of things, as, as the choristers are when they're singing. Um, generally, I mean, I tend to say to them, well, you'd be much more upset if your voice didn't break, really, wouldn't you? Uh, <laughs> I think they would. <laughs> right, now the first thing you've got to do is to sing some notes as I play them. You just listen to them carefully and sing them to R. Here's the first one. Now then, can you sing this for me? Just do R. Okay. The finite time a boy's voice is suitable means that the director of music, Dr. Wills, is faced with a continuous process of finding new talent. Let's just do the first verse, shall we? Uh, I'll pick it then. Boys from all over Britain, as far away as the Shetlands, apply for auditions to become choral scholars. Tests as all the others. What you have to do first is listen to each note as I play it and sing it. Here we go, the first one, to la. To encourage the best to apply, King's School gives bursaries which cover a considerable part of school fees. We were the first, I think, to put ours up to two-thirds fees, and last year we had an enormous number of candidates. It, it dropped a bit this year, when sort of three years ago, we had two boys for one place. But since we put ours up, a lot of other places have as well. And there's a sort of rat race between various choral foundations. Um, either to get in first in October, sometime just before Durham, who started, or at Easter after Kings and Johns have done theirs to pick up those who haven't got a choral scholarship. But there is quite a lot of competition. Uh, there are boys we've turned down who are in choirs I'd better not name. Um, and I dare say we've got some who've been turned down by other places. It would be useless to have a choir boy with a fine voice who didn't have the academic ability to fit into the school. And this is the responsibility of the master of the junior school at Ely, Mr. Roger Firkins. I'm looking to see that we can teach them. They have to fit into the, the kind of child we have in the school, but that is within a very wide academic range. And it's very seldom that we come across anyone that they like and we don't, partly because when they're being tested by Dr. Wills, he asks them to read a psalm. And if they can get themselves around the word like Melchizedek or something, they are seldom unable to read the sort of thing we want them to do. 
they devour me and tear me in pieces. Do you know what devour means? Eat. Eat, it does, doesn't it? Yes. Then look to Roger on the school side, and then over to Arthur as is our new usual practice, and, and go through the list. Okay, the final decision about which boys should be chosen is taken at a meeting where the boy's academic ability, his musical talent and his general suitability is discussed by the master of the junior school, the director of music, and Canon Roger Green, the vice dean of the cathedral. Um, so, without further detail, I, I, it's definitely a yes for me. Yeah, it's not yeah. good, we can agree on one. That's right. <laughs> For the new boys, an opportunity to take their place with the rest of the choir at Easter in one of the most solemn and glorious of musical events. The great cathedral towering over the flat fens rings to the sound of boys' voices, men's voices, musicians and a million echoes joining in an experience which will remain with these boys for the rest of their lives. later on but yeah I hope so yeah so you feel on the whole that it's been beneficial being part of the choir I do certainly yeah yeah it's given me a lot of training and yeah I do yeah it's been great what will you do now just keep like the non-choristers and stay at the house and no I'm gonna go up to the senior school and leave music apart from, I won't go and carry on percussion and piano maybe but apart from that, I'm going to leave it alone. And when you finally leave school, what would you like to do? Play drums in a band. Mm -hmm. 